Okay, so this lecture is on Nietzsche on the value value of truth. Um, this is not so much Nietzsche scholarship, it is mainly Nietzsche scholarship, but it's also on this larger philosophical question, uh, the value of truth, which I think is a question that Nietzsche raises more than any other philosophers. In fact, most philosophers just say truth is a fundamental value and it cannot be questioned. And the interesting thing about Nietzsche is he gives us conceptual resources that allow us to question the value of truth. But first I need to distinguish two different questions. There's a causal genetic question, if you like, that is why do we value truth, right? And that is separate from the other question, which is a normative evaluative question, why should we value truth? Nietzsche has things to say on both questions, why we do value truth and the question of whether we should value truth. But it's important to get those, those two apart. And just to begin with some nice quotations from Nietzsche, this is from Beyond Good and Evil 1. The will to truth, which still tempts us to many a venture, that famous truthfulness of which all philosophers so far have spoken with respect, what in us really wants truth? A still more basic question. We asked about the value of this will. Suppose we want, suppose we want truth. Why not rather untruth? And from, beyond, from Genealogy of Morals, Essay 3, Section 24, the will to truth is in need of a critique. Okay, some more preliminary points. Um, I don't think that Nietzsche has any theory of truth. You know, you've got these classical philosophical theories like a correspondence theory of truth. The truth is when a claim corresponds with reality or coherence. A claim is true if it coheres with every other claim you believe, etc. I don't think Nietzsche is interested in those kind of philosophical questions. As I said before, he's not really interested in metaphysics, he's not really interested in epistemology. We could equally say he's not interested in semantics, semantics being the part of philosophy that investigates what the property of truth is, or if it is a property. Rather, Nietzsche is interested in these uh, genealogical, psychological questions, what has led us to value truth so highly, and what is the motivation for our will to truth, and should we value truth? Okay. So that's the first point. I don't think Nietzsche has any theory of truth. I usually make the joke, you know, my mum, um, who lives in Australia, she thinks it's true that I'm in London, but she doesn't have any theory of truth. Well, I think Nietzsche's not quite as unsophisticated as my mother on this point, but he's not far different from them. He doesn't really have any worked out theory of truth. And he didn't really care for that kind of philosophy, finding out exactly what the property of truth is. Okay. The second thing I need to um, point out is, um, I'm going to say very briefly, is there are some interpreters, again, the postmodernists, who often interpret Nietzsche as, as rejecting all notions of truth, right? There's a very famous essay he wrote called, he wrote, did not publish during his lifetime, on truth and lie in the extra moral sense, which is quoted over and over again, um, where he says truth is just an army of metaphors that have become common coin. And some of those passages from that uh, work and from some of his other works sound extremely skeptical about truth. But in evidence of the claim that Nietzsche believes there are truths, and when Nietzsche is skeptical about truth, it's usually about the notion of metaphysical truth. He's always skeptical about the notion of metaphysical truth, but I believe in truth and I'm skeptical of metaphysical truth too. But in evidence of the claim that he believes there is such a thing as truth, I take the first section of the first essay of the genealogy of morals, where he talks about English psychologists. And he admires English psychologists because he says, look, they're trying to get to the psychology um, 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 behind our moral values, whether they make it as self-interest or whatever. And he thinks at least they're trying to do the psychology, and he says all power to them. But then he criticized them for being very, very bad psychologists. But at the end of it, he does say, um, he does say, uh, he, he uh, praises them for their attempts to get the real psychological mechanisms behind our moral values, but then criticizes them for their perceived values of their actual accounts, and he concludes simply, there are such truths meaning psychological truth. So in other words, I'm not one of those interpreters who take Nietzsche as, as denying that there are truths. Uh, he's skeptical about metaphysical truth, but I think he actually thinks his psychological accounts are by and large true, and it's important for him that they be true. Though ultimately he cares about the normative um, aspect. That is, he, his ultimate value is enhancing culture and civilization and enhancing um, the possibility of great individuals. But still he thinks he can do that by getting at certain psychological truths. Okay. Um, now, I want to give you a Nietzschean perspective that'll make you wonder about the value of truth, because it's very, very hard for us moderns to do that. As I say, most modern philosophers, people like Bernard Williams, will just say, 
truth is just a fundamental. We don't seem to have a perspective from which we could see that there might be some disutility to truth. Okay, and actually going back to a um, a, um, a non-Nietzschean evaluation of the of those questions. Remember, we have two questions: the questions why do we value truth, and then the question why should we or shouldn't we value truth. There are other people who have um, 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 versions of answers to this. Uh, for instance. Um, my colleague at the New College of the Humanities, Dawkins, um, will give a, a, a proto-evolutionary account, a Darwinian account of why we should value truth. And you can see what the story is pretty obvious, that in the way of belief, it's useful to have by and large true beliefs. Like if you believe arsenic is going to nourish, you're going to exhibit what uh, late 20th century philosopher Quine called somewhat right-wing this next point, a, a pathetic but praiseworthy tendency of dying before you reproduce your kind. Well, I'm not saying I prove the sentiment at all. I don't see the praiseworthy part. But anyhow, you get the drift that a, a, a evolutionist can give the following account of why we do value truth. That we value truth because if you have false beliefs, like if you think it's the bread that poisons and the arsenic nour nourishes, you're going to probably not get to reproduce your kind. Um, so that would be an evolutionary account of why we do value truth. It doesn't give an answer of why we should value truth unless you enshrine the idea that what is ultimately valuable is survival. But that's a question, and it's not clear the evolutionary, the person giving the evolutionist account can back that. He certainly can back this claim of, of why we do value truth. I'm not saying it's the right account, but he does have account. I'm not, but I wonder if he can give an account of why we should value truth. Okay, well, Nietzsche has a different story about why we value truth, which I'll come to later. But what I want to get across now is Nietzsche's perspective, which shows us a way of seeing that there might be some other value according to which truth might not be an ultimate value. Okay, so what Nietzsche th um, believes is, Nietzsche thinks, as I said before, that the ultimate point um, for humans is not to avoid suffering, not even to be happy, but to find meaning. And what Nietzsche wants to claim is our will to truth, and I mentioned this in the last lecture, will to truth is a part of what destroys God and leads to nihilism. So you can already see the trajectory. Nietzsche says our will to truth destroys our ability to believe in mythologies, right? Religion being one of those mythologies. And he says, look, those, 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 those mythologies are really, really important uh, for giving meaning to our lives. I'm missing a page here that I wanted to read some quotations from. Um, yeah, so this is from beyond, sorry, this is from the birth of tragedy. He says, without myth, every culture loses the healthy, natural power of its creativity. Only a horizon defined by myth completes and unifies a whole cultural movement. Okay, so this again is something, as I mentioned in the last lecture, that he got from the Romantics. He said, look, what gave the center to Greek culture was that they had these, um, um, they had these gods that they worshipped. And these gods gave them ideals, norms of appropriateness of behavior and gave them a sense of what life is about, what their actions should be, etc. So Nietzsche, see, it's easy to think again of Nietzsche as anti-all religions. But as I said before, it, it's never is the will to truth good, is the ascetic ideal good, um, is a religion good or is it bad? It's not like that. It's, what is the function of this religion for these people? He's perfectly happy with the ancient Greeks having their religion because their religion, through their gods, they affirmed life. They gave themselves positive role models. See, the Christian God, he says, is a repudiation of, of life because uh, the Christian God, he's nothing like us. You know, he's omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, allegedly, nothing like us. And in, in, our natural drives are often an affront to him, something to be controlled or repressed. So we use our God, the Judeo-Christian um, morality, religion, uses their God to berate themselves. Whereas he thinks of the Greeks as actually affirming themselves through their gods. Like when um, if Achilles um, worships Ares, um, he, he, he's worshipping himself because Ares is just like Achilles, only more so. He's just as temperamental, he's just as vicious, he's just as brilliant a fighter, or should I say a more brilliant fighter. So the Greeks in their gods worship themselves. So Nietzsche is perfectly happy with that. Um, but the point I want to make is whether it's a, 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 whether it's a god that you use to berate yourself or a god that you use to affirm yourself, Nietzsche says these myths, the myths of religion, give meaning to our life. Okay. Um, as he says, this is, a, this is from the Untimely Meditation, Essay 2, that's called On the Use and Abuse of History for Life, which is important to our theme. Um, 
this is in section seven, he says, all living things require an atmosphere around them, a mysterious misty vapor. If they're deprived of this envelope, if a religion, an art, a genius is condemned to revolve as a star without any atmosphere, we should no longer be surprised if they quickly wither and grow unfruitful. It is the same with all great things, which never succeed without illusion, as Hans Sachs says, Sachs says in The Meistersinger. That's an opera by Wagner, which I'll come to later. But so there's this important theme that Nietzsche has, is that life needs illusions, right? Uh, we might need the illusion of a kind of religious mythology that gives us a sense of who we are. Uh, he often seems to think that even our everyday concepts involve illusions, and there's a lot of debate in, the, in, in, in um, uh, Nietzsche's scholarship about whether he thinks even using a concept like cup involves some kind of illusion. I, I find that thought very non-congenial. The idea is that Nietzsche thinks whenever you use a cup, you falsify because you're classing this cup with every other cup, but they're all individually different. I, I'm not sympathetic to that at all, but there is a strain of Nietzsche which scholars argue about, about how much he thinks even everyday concepts falsify. But that is not germane to the point I want to make, because those everyday concepts like cup are not the things that give meaning to our lives. It's our great religious convictions or our great moral convictions that man's duty is to pursue the sunum bonum, if you want a secular version of it. That for Nietzsche is just another mythology. And these, it's these mythologies that give meaning to life. And, so, and that is a particular problem he sees with modernity. Uh, modernity, with its will to truth, demands that we sacrifice every mythology. But in sacrificing mythology, we evacuate life of meaning. And that is why Nietzsche can provide us with a perspective to think, how far should we pursue the will of truth? Isn't it more important to find life meaningful? Isn't, doesn't life have to be fundamentally meaningful to us? And if our will to truth evacuates life of all meaning, then maybe our will to truth deserves to be questioned. And here I'll, I, I, I reference this passage and try to do it from memory, but here I'll quote it uh, directly from the Genealogy of Morals uh, 3, section 28. Um, again, he's really addressing Schopenhauer to a certain extent. He did, Man did not know how to justify, explain, affirm himself. He suffered from the problem of his meaning. He suffered otherwise as ill. He was for the most part a diseased animal. But the suffering itself was not his problem. Rather, that the answer was missed to the scream of his question, to what end suffering? Man, the bravest of animals, and the one most accustomed to suffering, does not negate suffering. He wants it. He even seeks it out, provided one shows him a meaning for it. But to this end of suffering, the meaninglessness of suffering, not suffering itself, was the curse thus far stretched over humanity. Okay. Well, Nietzsche thinks that is a particular problem um, uh, for us moderns. Um, because we moderns destroy all mythologies and uh, destroy all the basis for providing um, um, meaning. And in particular, one version of ne that Nietzsche seems to ascribe to is um, it's possible that Nietzsche thinks the scientific view pursued to its end evacuates the world of total meaning, not just by destroying the mythologies, but by destroying morality in a certain sense. Because if you think of it, if you think of it of, of the ultimate religious view, and again, that philosopher I mentioned before, Quine, um, I'm just looking for the relevant quotations, but I just can't seem to find them. Um, yeah, someone like Quine would say that science leaves no room for values, that science is a purely descriptive enterprise, and so it can't give us values. And Nietzsche actually echoes this. Um, he says in Genealogy of Morals, or pre-echoes it, since he's writing before Quine, Genealogy of Morals, Essay 2, Section 25, science is far from standing on its own. It first needs a value ideal. It itself is never value creating. And think about part of the emphasis of science is that we should value the truth. But consider that very claim, we should value truth. Is that a scientific claim? It's not a scientific claim. It's not a descriptive claim at all. It's a normative claim. So it's, it's, um, it's also from his um, 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 notebooks. Science probes at, at the processes of nature, but it can never command man. Man must evaluate what he experiences. Religions gain their power by being standards of value. In other words, it's religion that gave us the value of truth. An event appears in a different life when looked at from the point of view of myth. Okay, so Nietzsche, I kind of get lost in my notes here. I wanted to get some other uh, quotations, but I'll know roughly where I want to go. Um, 
It's quite possible to read Nietzsche as someone who thinks that values are not out there in the world. There's a modern term for it. I'm a bit reluctant to ascribe a meta-ethics to Nietzsche because I don't think he was that fine-grained and it's using our terms a bit, it's being a bit anachronistic. But there are a lot of passages which I can't drum up in my notes here um, where Nietzsche sounds like he's a projectivist about values. That is, he thinks values are not there in the world. You know, there's a property of being a... Um, being a cup of coffee, there's a property of being negatively charged, which an electron can have, but there's no property of being good or bad. Those are just projections. There are plenty of passages where Nietzsche says values are merely projected in the world. And a lot of people like Quine, who are very scientific philosophers, take exactly that line. They say, look, in the scientific view, there is no truth to the fact that the truth is good or that murder is bad that those are just projections of our values onto the world and the world itself, to use a, a metaphor that Nietzsche uses in the quotation I can't find, the world is itself in some sense colorless. We color it. That is, we're the ones who project our values. So in Nietzsche's view, science can't give us values, but it's values that give meaning to the world. So in, in his view, science, taken literally at face value, can't provide values and, and can't provide meaning. So where does science get it's implicit value, the value of truth, okay? Well, Nietzsche has a story to tell, and, and that is the most interesting story, and that is what is really wonderful in the genealogy of morals. For me, the key passage of the genealogy of morals is section three of the third essay, because there he's talked about religious ascetic ideals. He's been very negative about Judeo-Christian values. He says they're basically values based on repression of one's drives and self-hatred. And he says, surely there has been a counter-ideal Surely, there's, and this is when his audience, who are strangers to themselves, as I mentioned last lecture, they, he's been talking about these people in the past, and that's a distancing operation, that's not us. But in section 23, his audience is meant to be revealed to themselves. I think that's the structure of the, the rhetorical structure of the, of the essays. What he says is, surely there's been a counter-ideal to the religious ascetic ideal, with all its superstitions and otherworldliness. Surely it's the ideal of truth and objectivity and science. And then he says, most remarkably, he said, no, that is not a counter to ideal, to the aesthetic ideal. It is actually its most sublime and highest manifestation. So he wants to say the religious, sorry, the um, uh, scientific ideal, the modern ideal of objectivity and truth is really basically a religious ideal. And he wants to see its genesis, actually, because he, as he says, science itself can't create values. Science is not involved in the game of what should be. It's in the game of what is. It's at the, merely at the descriptive value, not at the normative evaluative level. So what Nietzsche claims is actually the scientific will to truth is nothing but a successor of the religious will to truth. Remember in last lecture we talked about uh, the death of God and we said, look, there are a lot of people, secularist humanists, who have given up on the metaphysics of Christianity but kept those values. Well, one of those is the value of truth. Because the religious worldview tells us we should value the truth because it's God's word. See, the religious worldview answers both the descriptive question, uh, why do we value truth? We value truth because God told us to, because truth is God's word. And it gives the same answer to why we should value truth. We should value truth because God commands us to value truth. So Christianity and, the, and various religions can answer both the descriptive question of why we value truth and the normative question of why we should value truth. But now we moderns, stripped of that Christianity if we're secular, cannot really answer the question of why we should value truth, right? We don't accept it because God tells us to, right? And the evolutionary story just tells us a story about why we do value truth. If we think of, yes, survival is the ultimate value, then possibly it tells us a story about why we should value truth. But I'll have more to say about that in a, in a moment. But at the moment, what Nietzsche is saying is he's saying the, the, the modern value, and think of us, nearly all of us here will put a high value on truth. He says that's just an overhanging of, that's again, us not appreciating the death of God. Because the value of value, the value that we have in valuing truth is something we inherited from our Judeo-Christian tradition but now Nietzsche says to really appreciate the death of God is to question that tradition. And so now we can raise the question, why should we value truth? And Nietzsche has given us a very big perspective in which to raise this question. That is to give a negative answer, saying maybe we overvalue truth. That is to say, ultimately what is important for us is to find life meaningful. And the will to truth, Nietzsche says, destroys all our mythology 
And it might even destroy all morality because it leads to a perspective where you see morality, there's no fact of the matter about morality. Mar morality is just a human projection onto the world. Okay. Also, Nietzsche tells a, um, a psycho psychological story, which you can take or leave, but I think it's really fascinating, b about why a lot of us, especially scholars, value truth. And it's a very, very negative story. When Nietzsche talks about religion and the genealogy of morals in particular, the Judeo-Christian heritage, he paints the following story. He basically says, these, the original Christians were weak people who couldn't act on their drives. So they try to kind of obliterate this world. They say, this world doesn't matter. Yes, I'm weak and pathetic in this world, but that doesn't matter. What really matters is the world to come. And in the world to come, my very weakness, the fact that I always turn the other cheek, the fact that I repress my hostile impulses, that's what will allow me to enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so it's like they stand above the world, they look down on it, and they say, well, that world doesn't matter. It's not the real world. The real world is the world to come. And for Nietzsche, this is kind of a revenge. It's like the world has denied my desires, so I'm hostile towards the world, so I deny its importance and make do with a fantasy world of a world to come. Well, Nietzsche has the same story about the impetus to truth in scholars. He says a lot of scholars, the fundamental psychology behind them is um, they stand above the world, and if they're secular atheists, they don't look at a world to come and say, oh, that's the real world, but they stand above the world and they say, what's really important is not acting in the world, it's reflecting upon the world. So they enshrine, reflection is man's highest activity, his ultimate activity. But in a way, and Nietzsche puts it very nicely in the third essay, The Genealogy, he says, what does a scholar demand? He demands the passions cooled. Well, that's the same psychology of repression of the drives, the thing I talked about last uh, lecture, which was I said was the fundamental, of, fundamental um, aspect of um, what I called effective nihilism. So Nietzsche says, so again, he makes the will to truth, he gives it a, a, a motivation that is very um, novel. That is, he says, a lot of our modern scholars' will to truth is another defense mechanism against a world that has not answered to their desires. So they, they, they respond to the world by saying, no, my desires, my passions, they don't really matter. What really matters is to be merely reflective, okay? So he's questioned the will to truth in two ways. One, he makes it look as if it's got a, a very negative orientation. It's an orientation of, of a negative attitude towards the world. And two, he said, look, this will to truth can be so destructive that it leaves us with a world that, that is not human anymore. Because ultimately for us humans, what we need is, is, is a meaningful world. Now I wanna backtrack a bit and talk about the usefulness of truth. Um, because remember, when I briefly mentioned the evolutionary account, um, we said, oh, the evolutionary account can give us some story about uh, why we do value truth, that it's, having the truth is conducive to survival, and why possibly why we should value truth, that is, if we see survival as an ultimate value. But in fact, and here I'm putting on my hat as a philosopher of science, it's not really clear that we need a true theory. For instance, a lot of people have argued in science, what we need in a science is not necessarily a true theory, but a theory that makes the right predictions for observables. And in fact, other people, for instance, Nancy Cartwright, I'm thinking there of Bas van Frazen. Bas van Frazen says, all we want is not a true scientific theory, we want a theory that makes the right predictions about observable. He called that constructive empiricism. Uh, you're trying to get a view that constructs, gives us theoretical construction that makes the right empirical predictions. But another point to be made about here, about the value of truth, is, um, what Nancy Cartwright says, a philosopher of science who talk, has a book, Why the Laws of Physics Lie. And she basically says, look, all of science involves incredible simplifications that allow for what we might call a tractable theory. A tractable theory is a theory that we can compute. See, it might be that the actual truth is so mathematically and in other ways complex that if we had a total truth, we had a theory that wouldn't generate any accurate predictions about the observables because it was too complex. So I'm just here giving you a perspective to say that even if we care about information that is conducive to survival, it's not clear that we have to worship the truth. We can worship the truth maybe about the observables, but maybe when it comes to the really the detailed scientific inquiry, we'd much rather have a theory. If you gave me a choice between the total, supposing God could come down and say, here's the total truth, but I've got to tell you, for you it's useless. It is so damn complex, you'll never be able to compute anything. But you say, okay, here's a series of laws. They're actually, all of them are false, but they lead to the right predictions about the observables, but I've, they're incredible simplifications. 
I'd go for the tractable theory if I was thinking merely of utility. So we even have, there's a non-Nietzschean's perspective, but we have non-Nietzschean's perspective, even if we're thinking merely of survival and usefulness, to question the, the value of truth. Okay, well, a lot of what I've been saying um, sounds like Nietzsche does not uh, value truth at all. And now I'm going to have to shuffle through these pages and find out the pages I really need to, um, I want to refer to. Um, I think it's got totally out of order. Okay, it sounds to, the way I've been lecturing sounds as if Nietzsche does not value truth at all. And that is not the story I want to tell. Um, rather, as again, it's a very nuanced story. That Nietzsche wants to say, what does the value of truth mean for this individual? It's amazing how out of order these became. Like a bit of magic I've performed on myself. Okay. With, regarding the will to truth, the question for Nietzsche is never, is it good, is it bad, is what does the will to truth mean for this kind of person? Remember, I gave you this version where Nietzsche says, uh, as regards to scholars, their will to truth can be actually an aversion of life. Right? It's a way of stepping back from life. In fact, he wonderfully described, and I don't have the quotation here because I've mixed up my pages. Oh, yes, I do have it. Um, from Genealogy of Morals, it just jumped at me. Uh, sec essay 3, section 4. Science is a means of self anesthetization. Are you acquainted with that? That sounds really weird to us. But if you see the background I'm talking about, you can see why Nietzsche might mean that. He said, Some people are so obsessed with science, what he would call Wissenschaft, which we have to term, term, it's translated as science, but he means scholarliness is the word to think of, because science sounds like the hard sciences to us, like um, physics or chemistry, but by Wissenschaft, he meant both the human sciences, so that could be history, could even be philosophy, um, um, versus, uh, he meant, by Wissenschaft, he meant all scholarliness. So he thinks of scholarliness as a form of self-anesthetization. Are you acquainted with that? What he means by that is what I referred to previously, that some people use scholarship as a way of stepping back from the world, as a way of not being engaged in the world, so that all they want to do is reflect on upon it. They don't want to be engaged in it. So all of that sounds very negative about the will to truth, but that's the will to the truth in the form as presented by certain scholars. But Nietzsche is actually often pro the will to truth. And here's a quotation from Antichrist, the preface. The conditions under which anyone understands me and necessarily understands me, he must have an inclination born of strength for questions that no one has the courage for, a new conscience for truth that have hitherto remained unheard. Okay, so here he's actually in favor of the will to truth, right? But what he wants to say, what his considered view is, um, is that, look, there are certain people for whom the will to truth functions as a way of disengaging from the world, that is a merely contemplative scholar. But he wants to say there are people like himself and Goethe who use their will to truth to engage the world. And he begins his untimely meditation, the second of the untimely meditations, on the use of, and abuse of history for life, history being one of the key Wissenschaft for him, sciences. He begins it by quoting Goethe. He says, this is a quotation from Goethe, I hate everything which merely instructs me without increasing or immediately enlivening my activity. Okay, so his aver versions of events well, these notes are screwed up. Um, his, his versions of, of events are, there are certain people in himself, there are certain people such as himself and Goethe, who are involved in a pursuit of truth, not as a way of stepping back in the world, but, but in, engaging with the world. Um, there are other places where Nietzsche talks about um, a scholarly conscience, and he's actually very much in praise of that. I uh, don't have the pages in front of me, the quotations in front of me, but the general idea is there are several pl passages when Nietzsche talks about having a good conscience towards the truth, okay? So what does he mean by that? Okay. He thinks that what, what, what is really important is to face truths where you have something personally, personally at stake. And he admits that a scholar can have a good, have a, can have a, um, have a certain kind of conscience um, but what he means by that is, in their limited field of inquiry, they're willing to pursue the truth, but only in that limited field of inquiry. What he thinks about himself and Goethe is that they pursued truth even when they put their most fundamental beliefs, their beliefs that gave their lives meaning at risk. 
And it's that kind of conscience that he really values. So, I'm really thrown by my disorder in my notes. Anyhow, um, so, so Nietzsche uh, values the will to truth, but he values the will to truth as a means of engaging. And he values a, an intellectual conscience when it's not an intellectual conscience of convenient. Oh, when it comes to this level of scholarly inquiry, I will pursue the truth, but in the rest of my life, you know, I'll just believe what's convenient to believe. He likes a will to truth that puts something at risk, right? So it's actually very, there's a lot of ambivalence here and a lot of different um, angles that he's coming from. Because if you put the will to truth pressed too far can put everything at risk. It can, as I said before, evacuate the world of meaning, right? And Nietzsche is not, in fact, in favor of that. So how far is Nietzsche in favor of, of truth? Well, Nietzsche is in favor of truth to the extent, pursuing the truth, to the extent that it can enliven your activity. And he does think the stronger a person is, the more truth they can take on. And one of the things he prides himself on is that he's strong enough to have such a strong will to truth that allows him to dismantle many myths, mainly myths he sees as, sees as currently harmful, like some of Judeo-Christian myths, right? But does that mean he wants to pursue this will to truth to its end point, to the extreme? I think Nietzsche's ultimate value is you should pursue the will to truth till the point that it becomes harmful. And that's gonna be different for different people. Like Nietzsche is strong enough to face the evacuation of meaning from the world <coughs> because he thinks he's strong enough to give meaning to the world. He's strong enough to be an author for his own meanings. Right? But he thinks the vast majority of us, for instance, can't bear the idea of the world being evacuated of meaning as having a merely scientific descriptive view of the world. And so he thinks for us, that will to truth can be very, very harmful. So Nietzsche says, look, Will to truth, is it good, is it bad? It depends upon each individual. Right? And then he wants to say, to the extent that will to truth is harmful for an individual, that individual needs illusions. Okay? But there is a very big problem for us in modernity. Right? That is the problem of, can we consciously get ourselves to believe, illusion, believe illusions? That is, our will to truth has become so strong that we moderns, if you like, do not permit ourselves any illusions, and hence we evacuate life of meaning. But then the question is, what can we do to re-enchant re the world, to use a phrase of, of John McDowell's? What is it can we do to give the world meaning if we're set in this mode of always insisting the truth at any price, even at the price of every illusion of every mythology? Okay. And this is actually a problem he inherited from the Romantics, who I mentioned in the previous lecture. The Romantics thought that what gave the Greeks, what made life meaningful to them was that they could have their religion, and their religion gave them values, gave them a mythology. And the, the idea the Romantics had was, oh, the Greeks, they were naive. They had a naive mythology. That is, they literally believed these gods existed, and that gave meaning and norms to their life. But it says, we moderns, we can't, we can't naively believe in mythology. In fact, we're on a mode that insists on truthfulness uberalis, over everything, and it destroys every possible mythology. Okay? And this becomes a huge, huge problem, both for the Romantics, people like Novalis and Hölderlin and Schlegel, and for Nietzsche, and also for Wagner. In fact, I'm sure some of you know that Nietzsche, very early on, hitched his star to Wagner to a certain extent, that he was a big supporter of Wagner. But actually, if you read Wagner's writings, which are very difficult to read, and I don't advise you to do it, they're 12 volumes, and he's all over the place and very contradictory, but Wagner presents a central idea behind his most famous cycle of operas, the Ring Cycle. And the basic idea is this, that uh, we moderns don't have a mythology, and since we don't, hence we don't have a genuine culture, we don't have a sense of unity, and the Ring Cycle of operas, that's um, uh, Twilight of the Gods, uh, the Valkyrie, uh, um, Siegfried, um, um, they are meant to give us a new mythology. But there's a huge problem here. That is, how can such a mythology work, right? That is, if we don't allow ourselves any mythologies, sure, while you're in the opera house, you might kind of take it on, um, but as soon as you're out of the opera house, you're gonna say, well, that was just an interesting bit of entertainment. And that is not what Nietzsche and Wagner wanted for mythologies. They thought mythologies are meant to animate all of your life, as religion previously animated your, all of your life. 
Wagner's solution, I don't think it's a very happy solution, was that he thought that somehow his... When you saw the four operas of the Ring Cycle, you were meant to see them over four consecutive nights, and some of them are six hours long. The idea was you were so immersed in that that it would work at you below the level of conscious. And he said, oh, there are musical themes that instantiate certain values, and these musical themes will infect you. I, I think it's a pretty fanciful story. As I say, it turns out, and this was Nietzsche's end objection to Wagner, that it turns out that this is not a reinvigorating mythology that's going to give us a new culture. It's actually kind of just entertainment. He also thought um, uh, Wagner had lapsed back into Christianity, but I'm not going to talk about that now. So how did Nietzsche want to solve this problem? Well, as I mentioned in last lecture, Nietzsche did not think he was going to provide a mythology for all of us. Right? He'd given up that aspiration. In fact, he thought most of us are just bound for what he would call Philistine culture. In fact, he often called, um, he talked about, um, um, uh, I've forgotten the germ now, Bildungsphilister, educated, Raikuda would say educated fools, but uh, the proper version of it is um, educated Philistines. That is, he thought there were these educated Philistines who have this will to truth in one circumscribed area, but it's not a will to truth that is willing to that is willing um, to risk great values, and it's not a willing will to truth that is going to allow them to create a clearing, which is what Nietzsche wanted to do, to create um, new values. They have a limited will to truth, but what Nietzsche thought is with his will to truth, he could actually possibly invigorate others in a certain way. But again, there's a question of how does he do this? How does he inspire them? Well, part of his inspiration, as I mentioned last lecture, was to destroy previous values, right? But he also thought more than that. He thought, and Alexander Neymar captures this book on Nietzsche life as literature. He says, what Nietzsche does is he, he provides an inspiration of a, a figure Nietzsche who created his own values. And he was hoping to inspire others to do. And as I tried to argue in the last lecture, he thinks he did, we can think of him, look back of him retrospectively and say, yes, he did inspire many people to create their own values, right? But in the act of creating values, if they've also got, if they've got this, this hyper extenuated will to truth, that is going to be inimical to creating values. So Nietzsche, when it, when it comes to his own values, what is the value of culture? What is the value of great individuals? In some sense, it might be arguably a critical blind spot for Nietzsche. Nietzsche doesn't press that question, because if he presses that question in the modern sense and demands grounding for everything, he might himself find a world evacuated of meaning. So for us, for Nietzsche, it's a personal act, again, prefiguring the existentialist, to give things meaning. And your will to truth has to be seen, has to be seen um, from multiple angles. That is, it's got to be seen in a very local way. Say, what is the function of the will to truth here? The will to truth here can be used positively to destroy values, but um, to destroy values in order to leave a clearing for creating new values. This allow me to make a point I didn't make in last lecture. Nietzsche talks a lot, oh, not a lot, Nietzsche scholars talk a lot. Nietzsche talks once in his whole text, but I think it's fair for Nietzsche scholars to make a lot of, an, of passive and active nihilism. Nietzsche seems, the story one wants to tell, and the scholars do tell based on this one passage, but I think it's fair to extrapolate it, is that Nietzsche sees himself as an active nihilist. That is, he's someone who destroys previous values in order to create a clearing to create new values. It's still an engagement with the world. You create, you, you destroy values in order to have a re-engagement with the world by projecting new values, colouring the world in a different way, to use that metaphor. But the passive nihilist is someone who destroys values with no positive project involved, just out of resentment towards the world. And that is the kind of nihilism uh, um, um, uh, Nietzsche rejects. So will to truth and even nihilism have both po positive and negative aspects. So whenever Nietzsche is judging the will to truth, he's looking at particular individuals. In his own case, in Goethe's case, he sees their will to truth as not a mere destructiveness, but as a way of engaging with the world, a way of questioning values so that they, then they could create their own values. Okay? With us moderns, he sees our will to truth ultimately as leading to, um, to a discoloration of the world, to an evacuation of meaning, to a destruction of all myth. 
and he sees that as, as a very negative um, um, force. Okay. I want to talk a bit now about, about how illusions can work, okay? This is again prescinding, this is not Nietzsche's point in particular, but it's a point that's uh, germane to the way Nietzsche puts it. In an everyday sense, we can see illusions as very, very important. Like, like uh, I'm, I'm always amazed at my colleagues' ability to think of their work as really, really important. I mean, unfortunately, I, I can't get involved in that illusion too much, but you can see it's really, really helpful. Right. I mean, part of my problem is I weigh myself against Nietzsche. And, you know, that's a really losing proposition because that guy's a creative genius and I'm just a kind of a fairly good humdrum Nietzsche scholar. Right. Um, but it really helps to have the illusion that one's work is really important. It invigorates you. It gets you more involved in your projects. OK, so those kind of illusions in an obvious sense are really, really helpful. But also think about think about a sportsman. It turns out that most really prime sportsmen have incredible overinflation of their abilities. But that overinflation of ability, that illusion, helps them perform better. And to give a last case that is often given in epistemology classes, um, allegedly there are statistical um, evidence for the claim that if you are trapped behind enemy lines, let's say this was in the Second World War and the Vietnam War, um, you had, let's say, an 80% an, an chance of being captured, right? But if you believed uh, you know, I think of, a, and I'm an American citizen, so I can say this without sounding anti-American. If you're extremely American gung-ho and you say, I'm the guy who's going to survive, that increases your chances of being, that, that means your chances of being captured before they were 80%, now they go down to 65%, let's say. I'm pulling these numbers out of the air. So on the basis of evidence, that is, if you're thinking merely epistemically, that is being sensitive to the evidence, you'd still think on the balance of probabilities, I'm going to be captured. But if you can get yourself over that belief, through illusion and tell yourself, oh, no, I'm not going to be captured, it has the pragmatic effect of lessening your chance of being captured. So you can see why it's in your best interest. So I'm just giving you these cases where in everyday life and in exceptional cases, it helps to have illusions. Illusions are necessary often to animate our activity. In fact, Nietzsche thinks if we strip ourselves of illusion, we strip ourselves of nearly every impetus towards genuine and creative activity. So Nietzsche is giving us this perspective where, as I say, it's a mixed perspective. He said, the trouble is we have, we, the religious aspect turns truth into an ultimate unviable value. That is, it's an extreme value that trumps everything. Everything has to be sacrificed towards the truth. Initially, because it was truth is God's word, at least the religious people had a normative underpinning of why they valued truth. We moderns have given up on that underpinning, but we still treat truth as an inviable, overarching, ultimate value. Okay? The story I want to tell is Nietzsche sees truth as a value, but it's one of a competing set of values. So the pathology that we've inherited from the Judeo-Christian tradition in the West is this extreme overvaluation of truth. Nietzsche says, yes, value truth, but realize there are other values. And that's why he can raise this question, what is the value of truth? He sees the truth as, basically he sees it as having instrumental value. He says, look, the truth can be useful because it can strip illusions. Right? It can strip us of the illusion of Christianity, which is, what's his objection to Christianity? It's very easy to think, oh, his objection to Christianity is that it's illusion. But he says in the Antichrist, he says, Christianity could be a thousand times falser, a thousand times stupider. I'm kind of misquoting here. And still, we wouldn't raise a finger against it. What I hold against Christianity is that it wants to cripple the strong. Okay? So, it's very easy to think Nietzsche is against illusions. But he acts somewhere else in the Antichrist, he says, it's not, I think it's section 36. He said, it's not that a lie is told, it is to what end a lie is told. Is this a lie, is this a myth that is told in order to invigorate life? Or is this a myth that is told in order to slander life? Okay, so Nietzsche is not against the will to truth, but he's against the will to truth in its pathological foundation, pathological manifestations. Okay, so Nietzsche himself thinks his own will to truth is, he has a value, he, he values truth, but he hasn't done this thing that we moderns have done, that is fetishized truth in this pathological way and turned it into a value to which everything must be, must be sacrificed, including all mythologies. So Nietzsche still has room for truth, 
right? And remember, we started with those two questions. Why do we value truth? Well, Nietzsche, rather than telling the evolutionary story, and I don't think he has to reject the evolutionary story, the evolutionary story tells us why do we value truth? We value truth because basically it has survival utility. Believing falsehoods like arsenic nourishes is not conducive to survival. I think Nietzsche can buy that story, but he also wants to tell a more nuanced historical story that we have certain religious values and they enshrine the value of truth. So he supplements the um, um, uh, evolutionary story with a historical story about the genesis of this value in, in, in our cultures. Uh, but he also has an answer to why we should value truth. We should value truth and why we shouldn't value truth. We should value truth in the way that often valuing truth is a way, a means of destroying certain mythologies that are harmful to us. Like he thinks Judeo-Christian values have now become largely harmful, at least harmful to the great creative individuals. But he also tells us a story about why we should limit our value of truth. We should limit our value of truth because the will to truth can be taken to such an extreme that it destroys everything that gives value and meaning to life. Okay? So truth remains a value for Nietzsche. And when he rejects or seems to reject truth, he's asking two questions. There are two aspects. He says, first of all, I'm totally suspicious of truth as an absolutely overriding value. That strikes me as a pathology. And I'm also worried about the meaning of the will to truth in certain people. That in certain people, this will to truth is just a manifestation, not of an engagement with life, but as an attempt to step back of life and be purely reflective. And that is also indicative of a certain kind of pathology. So Nietzsche has a will to truth himself and a will to truth he values, but because he sees it as an engagement of life, whereas he wants to diagnose a lot of us as having a will to truth that is in some sense fundamentally inimical to life. Okay, and at that point, I'll finish. Okay, I'll open the floor to questions. You're Christoph. Um, I wanted to ask you about this, um, this very interesting phrase, the will to truth, that he uses, and its relationship to his valorization of science. Um, so, I mean, to, to say the will to truth, um, I mean, it, it has a sort of psychological structure to it, right? It sounds like a striving for truth that will stop at nothing until it gets to the absolute truth or something like that. Um, and so I wonder why it is, um, and, and I can see that in the late work he, you know, he extols, for example, Zarathustra's truthfulness and he says um, truthfulness is now that, he, he describes it as the highest virtue in his case. And so he has this positive um, valorization of truthfulness and he has this sort of um, as you, as you described, a sort of selective um, valorization of, of truthfulness in the end. Um, but I wonder why, in the case of science, he continues to sound so negative about <coughs> scientists' will to truth, given that, so, I mean, in the sort of free spirit period of Humil to Human and Daybreak, he has this, this picture of science where he tries to sort of pare it down and say what science should be is this sort of modest inquiry after you know, kind of smaller truths that we can get hold of rather than this concept, sort of theologized conception of absolute truth. So I wonder if, um, I wonder why he doesn't, in the late work, like genealogy, say something like, the problem with science is it tries to get at this kind of inflated, absolutized theological conception of truth, whereas what science should be is um, an attempt to get at these more modest truths. In which case, you, you know, he wouldn't have to paint it in, in such a negative way. And also, science seems an arena where it seems it would seem strange to say we should be truthful, but in a selective way, given that science seems to thrive on the idea that pursuing um, the, you know, the, the pursuit of truth is itself something which will lead to further discovery or that will lead to continuing um, on the right track. It's a difficult question. Um, remember the genealogy of morals in section three, he talks about a counter ideal, right? And he says science does not provide a counter ideal. And we've seen one reason why, because science deals with what's descriptive, not what's prescriptive, and the values is about what should be, not what is, right? But it's more than that. It's not just that it doesn't provide a counter ideal. And Nietzsche is, the people in Nietzsche really admire are people who can manufacture ideals, like Socrates manufactured the ideal, the idea that reason is everything, that we should be pure reasoners and suppress our effective um, 
um, um, uh, emotive side. Uh, but science can't create new values, right? And so he admires those, even if they have neg values that he thinks in the end are um, um, ultimately negative, he admires the ability to create values, and that's what he aspires to be, someone who creates new values. Science can't do that, but it's also that science, what he seems to want to claim, and I hope this is the answer to you, is science tacitly assumes values which it's inherited, right? Because he thinks science, science pursues truth, and part of the reason why we care about truth, he says, is because it gives, part of it is what he called, as you know, the Socratic lie. The Socratic lie is that uh, suffering can be ameliorated through knowledge, right? Um, and, you know, people, uh, it's central to the Enlightenment. It's Descartes thought that if we pursue science to its end, we'll actually solve all problems, even the problem of death. We'll overcome the problem of death. Turns out he's not completely wrong about that, if you know some of the science of genetics. They actually found out um, what the physical basis of aging is. Uh, but I won't go into that now. It's not a philosophy of science lecture. I don't really think Descartes' right, but there's something to what he says. Anyhow, so the idea is that Nietzsche thinks, look, in, in our incredible um, estimation of truth that is enshrined in, our sci in science, it also comes with a certain kind of evaluative commitments, at least tacit value commitments that our society has. And one of those commitments is to that knowledge is a way of, of um, ameliorating the human condition. We have technological improvements through science that uh, can lessen, if not limit, suffering, right? But that shows an evalu set of evaluative commitments that Nietzsche is deeply suspicious of. Because that is what, remember I talked about the morality of compassion last lecture, that the morality of compassion treats the fundamental problem of society as a problem of suffering. And then the idea is, oh, as Socrates thought and as Descartes thought, science through its knowledge will ameliorate suffering. But that tacitly assumes this importance of suffering. And See, Nietzsche's take on suffering is very, very complicated. It's not that he's pro-suffering, but if you have this morality of compassion, you're in this mindset where you say, everything should be geared towards lessening suffering. And one of the great, not the only usefulness, there is pure inquiry, but you never know where pure inquiry is gonna lead. But one of the great things about science is it gives us technological innovations that help us ameliorate suffering. But Nietzsche's view is, as I said, not that suffering is a good thing, but he says, look, the be all, and Suffering shouldn't be the only vector of, of measurement of value. Another vector of measurement of value is a culture and great individual and geniuses. And then you see suffering in a different light because then you say, look, great individuals, great geniuses are people who aspire to some very difficult um, goals. They're the ones who take on great risks. And if you take on great risks, you're gonna have a life, a lot of which involves failure and suffering. So they say, Nietzsche doesn't say for suffering per se, but he says we have this fetishized um, extreme view that uh, what he thinks is a pathology of the elimination of suffering. But suffering, he thinks, is necessary for great project, for great ambition, um, um, and hence for great individuals, the individuals who move, move along um, society. It'll, uh, culture, I should say, not society. There's uh, one more piece I, um, I want to put on the board um, because it's relevant to... Um, um, science, uh, why he sees the will to truth of science in some sense in, in a negative aspect. That is, for Nietzsche, um, Nietzsche thinks, uh, he thinks more like Aristotle about what happiness is. Happy, there are two versions of happiness, and we moderns are very confused about it. One version of happiness is, um, happiness is like Bentham thought. It's a kind of a feeling in the stomach. I guess if I didn't want to be so derisory about it, I'd say it's contentment. Uh, feeling good about oneself. But there's another notion of happiness, which was Aristotle's eudaimonia, which is, if you like, happiness is realizing your talents. And that's what Nietzsche thought, right? And he thinks science, uh, modern science, is a manifestation of a sense of happiness, of mere herd contentment, the way he uh, deridingly uh, put it. So he's got this counter notion of happiness, where happiness is actually realizing all your talents. But realizing your talents, as I say, takes on involves taking on challenges um, and that involves suffering. So it's a long answer to your point, but your point is not as a matter of necessary fact, but as a matter of contingent fact. He thinks the will to truth in science 
is is also tied up with our modern obsession with amelioration of suffering, also tied in also with democratic values. And all of this, he says, is pointed towards herd happiness. And it's really when he's despising the will of science, he's despise the will to truth of science, he's, it's part of his um, negative reaction to herd happiness. But as you know, in certain sections, he says, scholars are all very useful in their own right. They are not ends in themselves. And he often admires scholars' will to truth. But it's when it's combined with a whole set of evaluative commitments, like these normative commitments to the ultimate aim of society is to herd happiness. That is what I think he's really reacting. But I think, as you're pointing out, he often oversells the case. But it's because he doesn't think, it's true it's not necessary, it's not necessary part of the will of truth to science, but contingent is as deep as it gets. And as a matter of fact, these values come in clusters. And the value that we give to truth and science and objectivity is often tied with these herd values of ordinary happiness. Sorry for the long answer. Now anyone will be scared to ask a question <laughs> at the back. Um, I just wanted to ask, about um, the mythology and the truth in mythology and what you might think that Nietzsche would think about um, the truth in mythology being the, the metaphors, not necessarily the actual stories themselves being a reflection of, of truth, but that there's metaphorical truth in there. I think that, that's a really, really deep question. Um, and um, it's, it's for this. Um, yeah. Putting it in politely, I think the way Nietzsche looks at religions is he says, oh, that God story, that's just a story we tell for the idiots, basically. That basically there's a set of normative, evaluative commitments we have, and people, some people um, need to be able to pin it on an authority figure, so we dream up gods. But what's, what's, essential, what's essential to religion is those evaluative commitments, right? Um, and the metaphysical story about the father figure in the sky is neither here nor, here nor there, right? But he still has to face a question of how we moderns can find our own normative commitments in the, when we've denied ourselves all such stories. And it's even worse if we buy into that extra story that says actually moral statements, if we're um, super scientific out of that philosopher Quine, and we say, oh, all moral values are just a projection onto the world. Morality isn't out there, okay? So Nietzsche has this huge story to tell. A and then he says, in some sense, you have to have the strength of will to project your own values without giving an underlying story about this is God's voice. You have to say, this is my voice, right? But for us moderns, he thinks of that as extremely difficult. That's why he says, let the, as I mentioned last time, let the ideas of the herd rule in the herd. Most of us are not strong enough. Okay? So yes to your point that um, what he cares about in these mythologies are not the metaphysics of it. He cares about the evaluative structure behind these mythologies. But what he does acknowledge is that most of us Remember, I was I condescendingly said he sees most. Uh, he sees the God story as a story you retail to idiots. Well, in some sense, we're all those idiots because nearly all of us need some such stories. We don't have the strength of will that Nietzsche had. Nietzsche says, "Yes, these are my values, but that does not stop me projecting them." The rest of us, mere mortals, so to speak, as soon as we tell ourselves these values are just merely a project, pro projection, we have a lot of trouble keeping to those values. So it's a big modern predicament that faces us, that Nietzsche has exposed. Any further questions? Yeah. Um, I remember Aspen. in a pub uh, section with the research students at Birkbeck, I was surprised to find that many of them um, confessed that um, they would like to be analyzed as if um, objective self-knowledge would somehow make them uh, be a happy person and I found this like and you also mentioned like in the beginning of the talk that uh, Nietzsche thinks that there are um, psychological truths so it's as if um, this somehow uh, enhances this modern man's belief in knowledge or in seeking psychological truths and thinking that this truth would make them happier person um, Nietzsche is actually, um, again, ambiguous on this question. Not, not, not ambiguous in the right word. Nietzsche says you have to answer individual to individual. 
Right? And Freud wonderfully said about Nietzsche, no one was more honest about themselves. I don't know if that's true, but it's an interesting point. That Nietzsche, Freud famously based his interpretation of dream on a self-analysis. Obviously, a lot of Nietzsche's work is, and he says this, a lot of my work is frankly autobiographical. I seem to be talking about Socrates in the way I'm talking about myself. Um, so we can say that Nietzsche was someone who looked at a lot of truths about his, his, his himself. But I think his attitude is exactly the attitude I mentioned before. When is a psychological inquiry good? A psychological, a self-psychological inquiry can be good to the point that it enlivens your activity, but to the point that it can, can become destructive, it's, it's no good. So Nietzsche thought he's a person who's strong enough to realize a certain set of facts, psychological truths about himself. And he does think for a lot of us, psychological truths are helpful because as you say, he says he's trying to get it, there are such truths and he seems to want to expose them. But that's because he thinks a lot of us have been crippled by Christianity, right? And to expose the psychological, uh, to expose the psychological mechanisms behind our subscription to Christian morality, he hopes will at least free some of us, right? So the story is always going to be in an individual, um, 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 individual level. And there's a famous story about. Um, Nietzsche being, I think it was again in Sils Maria in the Engadine in Switzerland, he was at some pension and two old ladies who were, I think, quite Catholic, came up to him and said, oh yeah, you're the fr famous scholar Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, which of my, can, can you give us some reading list? Can you give us some books we might um, read? And Nietzsche recalls in horror and says, no, no, you, you should keep away from my works, you know, I, I don't think you'd like them at all. And way to extrapolate the thought is to say, these people are not made for his books. And he was always wondering, does he have readers? So the idea is maybe these two old ladies hearing him um, rail against religion would not be effective for them. I don't mean effective in that they wouldn't believe it, but it could unroot them from their values in a merely negative way, leave them nihilistic if you like. Okay, so to what extent one should know the objective truth about oneself? To the extent that it invigorates one activities, to the extent that it can reorient one. To what extent what, what, would one want self-ignorance? To the self where that ignorance is necessary for one um, to genuinely engage in life. This will allow me aside about, there's a, um, a, a, a theory of called depressive realism. Take this with a grain of salt because I've been reading the psychology, first of all psychology is not much of a science to begin with, but also even the psychologists as usual disagree with themselves. But the claim is, um, that there are a group of people, um, uh, a particular group of depressives, and they tend to be more realistic than other people. So the idea is you ask a bunch of people, uh, non-depressives, about what others think about them. And the non-depressives give rather inaccurate opinions, rather inflated opinions about how others sees them. <laughs> then you ask the depressive people um, what others see about them, wh what others view about them, and they turn out to give really accurate views. So you get the idea. It's, it, I don't, I'm not sure whether it's the realism is allegedly causing the depression or the depression causing the realism. But you can see that there again, having accurate views could be inimical to your activities because these depressives are obviously not going to be very active people. They might be withdrawn from the world. And it could be their realism is one of the things that gets them to be withdrawn from the world. So yes, psychological truths. Um, Nietzsche thinks he could face a lot of psycho psychology truths, but and he, but it would have to be a case-by-case -case study for Nietzsche. Should you be facing these psychological truths? Well, if you're strong enough to bear them and be invigorated in your activity, yes. If these psychological truths will destroy you and make you passive towards the world, then they're truths you shouldn't face. Yeah, please. Sorry. Yeah, it's, sorry, it's kind of similar to the question I asked in the last lecture, but just in some places Nietzsche sounds very uh, individualist, like the kind of existentialist word. It's about me and my values. Sorry, it's about me and my values and creating my own values. Then he says about forming a new culture and new, presumably shared mythologies, and just see a kind of tension there, right? I mean, um, yeah, shared mythologies is a really interesting point. Um, the romantic thought what gave the culture unity and what gave an individual unity was that they have a shared mythology, right? Um, and Nietzsche seems in favor of mythologies to a certain extent, like he's got the mythology, the cult of the genius and uh, the great individual who moves culture. And that's a certain kind of mythology. And actually, interestingly, um, beyond, um, sorry, in Birth of Tragedy, and there's a certain section 
where he actually admits that he himself is retailing a mythology, the mythology of the genius, because he says every, every civilization, every culture needs a mythology. But the question is, is it going to be a shared mythology? Okay. Now, the Romantics thought you needed a shared mythology. They thought the Greeks had it with their pantheon of Greek gods. And Hölderlin, in one way to read Hölderlin's most famous work is Hyperion. And it's an attempt, it can be read as an attempt to create a new mythology, which is meant to be generally shared to a certain extent. And you can read that same about Wagner's ring cycle. It was meant to be the engine of German renewal and possibly European new renewal, possibly a shared mythology, though it's hard to expect that everyone's really going to be literally believe in Siegfried. And I mentioned this problem. Okay, so one way to read Zarathustra is, oh, uh, Hölderlin didn't work, uh, Wagner didn't work, here is my work. And it reads like a, you know, thus spake Zarathustra. It's written in this mock biblical style, or mock religious style, and it seems to be creating, creating a new mythology. And it's interesting, as he was, um, as he was finishing um, um, Zarathustra, he got news of Wagner's death. And he wrote into a letter to a friend, after all, to a great extent, I have become Wagner's heir. So it might be or what he's trying to do is get retail with Zarathustra a whole mythology. But I, I don't think that's right about Nietzsche. I, I think Nietzsche thought the idea of a shared mythology is, is highly unlikely, unless it's at this very general myth level, the mythology of culture. But even that's not shared because he thought the rabble, that is, he thought the, um, the herd, isn't going to share that mythology of culture, right? What he, so what he d now does is, all he does is he hopes that certain individuals will be inspired, inspired to create their own values, inspired to create their own mythology. But the idea of a shared mythology, I think Nietzsche thinks that boat has sailed. I think he thinks with modernism, with, with the modern mind and its hypercritical mentality, the possibility of us having genuinely shared values, not just in the herd, but even among the geniuses. And that's why Zarathustra says, here is my way, where is yours? He says, you have to find those values that can invigorate your um, uh, life and that you can put all your, your drives and energy towards. But I, I think he's right, largely become skeptical of the idea of a genuinely shared mythology. Personal mythologies are all that's left. Just on the idea of the shared mythology, then, what, what about sort of like the ecology uh, movement and sort of the Greenpeace and all that? That seems to be a sort of shared mythology. I'm not saying, I'm not doing it down, uh, but it's a sort of, it's, it's, it's a faith, but lots of people believe in it. Um, it's not necessarily a will to, tr it's not really about truth or science. Well, it, I suppose it could be, but it, it, it could be like the faith of, 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 of now, right? Yeah, well, there are there are yeah the mythology of Mother Earth and yeah, yeah. there are there are um, new mythologies. Um, God, ecology and Nietzsche, um, <laughs> hard one. Um, again, I think it's going to be a piecemeal story for Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche would have to um, um, look at what he thinks is the psychology behind behind the, that mythology. Um, and, but uh, first of all, you're making two points. Well, one is what is the value of that mythology, but also you're making the point that some mythologies are still available to us. To, to, right. to, to, to yeah. everyone. And, and I, I made a story whereby he thinks, um, um, he thinks mythologies are by and large not available to us. So there is a point to be made there. Um, I guess Nietzsche's thought is that for hypercritical people, like himself, uh, mythologies are, are not available. I think he'd allow that there are mythologies, like w the herd has a lot of mythologies. The herd has the m mythology of fraternity equality, you know, French Revolution alleged values. That's still a mythology. So when, when I said uh, Nietzsche thinks mythologies aren't available to us, he wants to say that mythologies, there are a, 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 a sizable subgroup of us he often, I think he thinks of the elite who make it because of their strong will to truth, um, 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 uh, destroy all mythologies. But he also wants to say that even among the most intelligent, they can have that not a completely clean intellectual conscience. That is, they question in one area and they destroy mythologies in one area, but leave it in another. Right? And again, Nietzsche's not against it. He just have to have a look at the value of that particular mythology. I think um, the ecology movement, in as much as it's still um, um, aligned with humanist values, 
would be something Nietzsche questions because Nietzsche sees those humanist values as largely democratic values and he thinks those as really the enshrinement of the lowest common denominator. But let me take from your point, it's a very good point, that it just shows you that there always are mythologies there and there always are values there. So let me say Nietzsche tells a, a, a complex story where he says, we have a will to truth that wants to destroy all, sorry, it's, gen, it's general, its general trajectory is to destroy all mythologies, but then he says we don't always have a good intellectual conscience. A good intellectual conscience is where the will to truth probes everywhere, right? But most of us have blind spots, okay? So we can tell ourselves, oh, there is no God, but Earth is ultimately valuable, or whatever an ecologist might tell himself, and that will be their blind spots. And what Nietzsche said about the interesting thing about Goethe and I is we, we have the smallest blind spot possible. That is, we really do question every mythology. And I think he's quite willing to concede your point that m for most of people, the intellectual conscience is quite limited. It destroys some mythologies, but it leaves others intact. But he does think that the mythologies that are left intact are not, very, um, are not generally powerful ones. But those mythologies can be powerful with a small subgroup in which they operate. Yeah. Um, by, by saying that truth should kind of go all the way where it goes, becomes destructive, he seems to be giving like a normative view of truth. But what would be the problem with a truth that is descriptive that includes the illusions that we have? And, you know, it would still be more marvelous than the illusion. He's not giving a theory of truth. Um, so he's not giving a normative theory of what truth is. I mean, as I said, I don't think he had a theory of what truth is. I mean, if I had to describe my mother a theory of truth, she, I'd say, you know, in that kind of trivial way, she thinks it gets the world right when she says Ken is in London. In some sense, it's a nascent, implicit correspondence theory of truth. I don't really think my mother has a correspondence theory of truth. I don't think Nietzsche has, but it's a natural way to fill out um, their everyday occurrences about this, utterances about this being true. So I don't think Nietzsche has any theory of truth. So it's, it's not a normative theory of, of what truth is. If you like, Nietzsche has no theory of truth, but it's, it's, it's a normative account of the value of truth, right? And of course, how that normative account goes depends upon what your values are. And it's because Nietzsche has certain values himself uh, which, and his, if you like, his ultimate values are things like culture and great individuals, that he can give a negative assessment of certain manifestations of the valuing of truth, right? He says, where the valuing of truth is inimical to these other values, I'm suspicious and skeptical about that will to truth, right? But where the will to truth enhances those other values, I'm in favor of it. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a normative theory of what truth is, it's a normative theory about the value of truth, but it is structured from his normative standpoint. And his normative standpoint, whenever, remember I said, um, look, Schopenhauer um, can't, be in, can't have disorientation, because disorientation says there are no ultimate values. But Schopenhauer says the world should not be. To say the world should not be, you've got to have an evaluative perspective. The value of perspective is this extreme valorization of pleasure over suffering, right? Well, when Nietzsche gives a negative account of the will to truth, he must have it from his own valuative perspective, right? which is, I think, your point. So he, he has normative commitments. It's not a normative theory of what truth is, but it's because of his normative commitments that he can have a negative value of truth, because his ultimate commitment might be something like culture or great individuals, and he sees a certain over, overburdening will to truth as inimical to that, and he says to that extent we should limit the will to truth. Chris at the back. So does he think that these um, overarching commitments that he has, are they, is it true that they are really valuable, valuable then? Well, his major voice, I mean, as I say, he's got no definite meta-ethics. I think it, it's anachronistic to pin up on him. Some people said he's a fictionalist about values, that values are just fictions we kind of convince ourselves in while we're playing the game of valuing, or he's projectivist. I think his major voice is to say uh, values are not out there in the world. Um, so, um, so your point is, is it true that great individuals are valuable, or is it true that um, uh, culture is a highest value, right? Um, how would Nietzsche react to that? It's very difficult to say, but I, I presume the story he's going to say is what Zarathustra says, these are my values, where are yours? Um, so he would say, this is an act of my commitment, this is what, having those values invigorates my life. Now, in fact, you'll notice that's an evasion of the question. 
right? I haven't answered your question, is it true uh, that culture is valuable, right? So I think Nietzsche would do exactly that. I think he would want to evade the question. What I think, but I think he may have enough philosophical commitments out there to end up actually being forced, if you were to go with the mere philosophical commitment, is to say, that is just another projection. That is my projection, which implies it's not true. It's not descriptively true. So if he was to follow his philosophical commitment, I think he'd have to step back and say, literally, uh, that we should value culture is not true. But I don't think that would be his mode of operation, because he thinks of psychologically. And he said, no, he would say exactly what Zarathustra says, these are my values, where are yours? Yeah. What is culture? Oh, my God. $64,000 question. Um, oh, I can answer um, what is unity uh, with my talk of sublimation. Uh, what is culture? Um, OK. Um, football doesn't count as culture. Um, but, OK, so Nietzsche is coming from this very elitist perspective. And it's what today we would call high culture. And, and really, I think Nietzsche is not going to give a definition of culture. But it's really, it's, it's like Aristotle and ethics. You can't educate people to see what is good. So, exactly wrong. You can't define what is good, but those suitably educated know it when they see it. That is exactly Nietzsche's view of culture. There are those of us who are suitably educated, and it may be a very small elite. It may be him, Goethe, Beethoven, or whatever, and we know it when we see it. You know, it's like uh, Goebbels' famous comment, Goebbels or Goering. Um, I always make this joke, but now I've forgotten it. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. When people mention, when people mention culture, I reach for my gun, and it was Carl Krauss or someone who says, when people mention guns, I reach for my culture. Um, <laughs> I, Obama could say that today, I guess. Um, Anyhow, yeah, this is a vexing question, but I don't think Nietzsche gives any semblance of a definition of, of, of what culture is. But he gives us examples. He says the Greeks have a high culture. We Germans now at the moment have a Philistine culture. But one thing I will say, okay, he thinks, you know, the, the truly cultured recognize it when they see it. But one thing he means about culture is that culture is meant to, culture, if you like, is a new religion for these, um, for these modernists like Nietzsche um, and also for, uh, for the romantics. That is, what they wanted of culture is culture was meant to give meaning to life. See, that, that is the objection to Wagner in the end for Nietzsche. I mean, yes, it's all about Wagner backslided into Christianity. But the real objection was he went to Bayreuth when the original festival came. What was that? 1876, I'll take a guess. Um, and he saw what he called all these cultural Philistines. That is, these people indulge in culture merely for entertainment. It's something we do on the weekend or some such. But he had an idea of culture very much, as I say, like a religion. Culture is something that's meant to animate all of your, our life. Like religion, not in its modern manifestations when there are Sunday Christians or whatever, or Saturday Christians or whatever, um, but when religion actually involved a whole set of normative pra practices that involved all of, all of one's life. Um, as it still does for a lot of people who are devout Muslims. You can see that their religion isn't just something they do on the weekend, it can infuse all of their life. Right. Um, he had the idea of a culture as somehow giving meaning to all of one's life, as, as um, um, enlivening all one's activity. But he didn't give a definition of it. That's just a subsequent point I want to make, that culture is meant to be something deeply meaningful, providing a meaning, not merely an entertainment. Like, liking Indian food is not a part of culture, right? unless you're deeply involved in the Indian food world in a way that gives meaning to all of your life. But what actually culture is, is uh, he obviously meant high culture, and that was to be decided by the, um, the doyens, the leaders of high culture. No definition of it. I don't understand it. <laughs> uh, Astrid? Um, sorry. Um, so, remembering the way he always talks about those people he can list that are true geniuses and the way he says that an, an interesting part of the slave mentality is the way they are complex would he would he be or I don't know in opinion in your opinion would he be able to say that science as a search for knowledge is something that makes the herd or the active community something interesting even though their search for truth may be yeah. Not that truly interested in... No, I, I think you're right. And as I say, he does say scholars are all useful, 
um, in their in their own way, but they're not they are they are merely a means to an end. They are not ends in themselves. He does think the will to truth, and he does think science has done a lot of good in a way. Like science has helped destroy certain mythologies that he thought were harmful, like the Christian myth, Judeo-Christian mythology. Um, it's it's just because when he when he least lists those people, he never mentions scientists. No, he, that's artists. true. In his list of, of great people, there aren't scientists, and it's because I think he thinks they don't. He thinks most people who practice science don't have what he calls an intellectual conscience. That is, that is willing to face truth in any domain at any price, right? Um, he says what they've got is they bore away at one little area. But remember I said culture is meant to inform all of your life? Well, that's what he thinks of scholars. He thinks scholars do their little work, they bore away at it, and he kind of admires their incredible will to truth in that area. But he says, but it doesn't inform the rest of their life. And he wants, he wants to, us to have um, uh, areas of commitment, deep commitment, that give meaning to all of our life, not just to the eight hours a day when I'm in my nine to five job or whatever. One last question. Yeah. 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 It, it, sorry to kind of push this point again, it feels like I'm being slightly petulant, but on, on this thing about culture and how it's taught, I mean, it seems to me that if culture, as you defined it earlier, is going to be something really radically individual, and uh, you said mythologies had to be kind of personal. Um, I don't really see how it could be taught. Uh, well, mythologies can't be taught. Um, right. We have to do personal mythology. Culture is not individual. Culture, Nietzsche yeah. thinks of culture so as there are these great geniuses and they know it and they see it. He knew, you know, Goethe was a, um, a uh, great mover of culture and people of the geniuses of today, the people that count, the, he often talks about the peaks and the valleys very condescendingly, we're all in the valleys and he and his luck kind are in the peak. Uh, they know that he's a mover of culture. So culture is, is, is not individual. Mythologies, I think, by, by, from us moderns will be largely individual. But he still thinks of culture as something that, you know, the cognoscente can recognize in, in each other. And on that happy note, let's call it a quit and thanks very much for coming appreciate it